Hey everyone, I'm Josh from Before. I'm here with the writer, director, editor, and star of The People's Joker, Vera Drew. Thank you so much for taking time to talk today. Thanks so much for having me, Josh. I'm really excited to be here. You, um, you've done something really cool, which is you made a feature-length film that takes place in the world of Batman and the Joker and Gotham City. Can you tell us about your film? Yeah, so basically, in, in it was like early COVID, uh, I started making, um, I, I really like kind of started freaking out when like COVID happened just because like I had wanted to make a film my entire life and it kind of was like settling in for me that like oh like is the world ending like I, maybe now is the time to really like dive in and like do it and um that like kind of coincided with this idea that sort of crystallized sort of as a joke um my friend Brie LaRose who is a writer from like Arrested Development and uh Lady Dynamite and stuff and we knew each other from working at uh, Tim and Eric's production company for years. She commissioned me to to re-edit Todd Phillips' Joker. And uh, it was just like a Twitter joke that I, but like when I got that artistic commission, I had never gotten an artistic commission before. So I was like really thrilled and kind of like, okay, like I'll, I'll actually do that. Like I, I had come up as a, as an editor in television and, uh, I also like worked with everything is terrible for a while and stuff like that. So I was, I was pretty familiar with um, that sort of like video remix style art. And uh, I, so I started re-editing Todd Phillips Joker and in that process kind of just like, I don't know, like kind of just realized like how like important to me Batman was my entire life. Like I just started having like all these memories resurfa resurfacing including one where like I remembered going to see Batman forever as a child and like having that kind of be like an early moment where I sort of realized I was trans like there was something about Nicole Kidman's character in that movie that just kind of like I identified with as like a six-year-old quote-unquote boy <laughs> so like it was so clear to me that these like characters and just like DC comics and stuff was like really deeply in my bones um and this idea just kind of crystallized, like, what if I take my life and sort of mythologize it using these characters? Um, and, you know, like, I'll I'll be the Joker in it instead of your Drew. And, like, my, I cast one of my best friends as the Penguin and, like, our relationship in it is just, like, what our relationship is in, like, real life. Like, we're, we're we've been comedy buddies for, like, over a decade now. And, uh, so yeah, it kind of that in like, it was so interesting because like I've heard other filmmakers sort of talk about like when an idea sort of clicks for them as it being like you almost see the entire movie at once. It's like a blurry vision of the movie, but that's like really how inspiration I think sort of works for a lot of people who make film. And that was really what happened. It was just like in an instant, I was like, oh, okay. Like trans coming of age Joker movie. I got to do it. If If I don't do that, I will be really upset with myself so yeah just dove in and started doing it so because the the film is is your personal story it's autobiographical it's legally protected by copyright law but you took on this project you did it without the permission of the copyright holders it's unauthorized it's unlicensed and i know you have this really great perspective about superhero stories and how the how the big studios or the rights holders they like to say superheroes these are the the mythical stories of our time can you share your thoughts about that rhetoric yeah i mean i think it's just like it's it's just a marketing thing uh more than anything like i think that that in and of itself is just part of like the propaganda machine that has kind of surfaced in a lot of these superhero movies not so much in DC movies, um, but I think like specifically like Marvel, uh, like if you really watch those movies and you just think about like what films were in the 80s and like how like pro-military they were and stuff, like we kind of see that in, in these films. And uh, 
you know, to me, like myth, myth itself is not like, it's not a sales pitch. It's not a marketing tool. Like myth belongs to the people. Like historically, that was the function of myth. Um, like it was, it was for coming of age and for people to sort of like understand their place in society. You know, I'm really drawn to Joseph Campbell while, while also recognizing like the hero's journey is very much part of like the toxic patriarchy machine in a lot of ways. But like, sure. I think it's, it's an interesting storytelling dynamic to sort of like the people have been using for centuries to, um, to understand themselves. So like, I really wanted to do that from, from my perspective and from like a queer perspective. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. I think I realized kind of in the process that these characters are, you know, that the marketing tool is kind of correct. Like these characters are like our modern myths, you know, like I think specifically about like how, you know, like my mother has never read a Batman comic in her life but she knows that Batman's parents were killed in Crime Alley and that was his origin story of how he became Batman. Like it's it's just embedded into like our DNAs and our consciousness at this point that it like might as well be kind of the closest thing we have to um, the Iliad or, or, or the Bible even like as far as right. like modern um, right. coming of age myth goes. Is that is that what you mean by naming it the People's Joker that you're kind of reclaiming it for us regular folks? I guess, you know, I think I never wanted it to feel like a reclamation in the way that like, you know, like Ghostbusters 2016 was like, now it's the girl's turn or anything like that. Like sure. I, I wanted it to be kind of this like signal to people, like a bat signal to people just that like, this is a different version of these characters that, that you haven't seen before. And it's told from an individual perspective rather than like a sort of boardroom perspective. Cause like all those superhero movies, um, not so much the Zack Snyder ones, which I love Zack Snyder, but the, like, I'd say like the Taika Waititi, like Marvel movies and stuff. Like if you read about how those are made, like they're really made by committee. And like, they're, even if they're made from this sort of like auteur perspective, they shoot with a very loose script that is very like ethereal and that, the studio itself can kind of shape into like whatever's nice and clean and like marketable. And I think it also, the title of the movie was um, a byproduct of the era in which we started writing it specifically, just because like it was like May of 2020. I ended up writing it with with my friend Bree who who commissioned the the remix and like, when we start the the summer like the summer we started working on it that was the summer of like George Floyd and like all the like protests that were going on and um this sort of like awakening that I think was sort of happening in America that like oh the government isn't going to just like take care of us if shit hits the fan and uh and you know also just thinking about things like the people's budget and like I think it was kind of almost like a play on just like the idea of, I guess, I guess rec reclamation, but in that way that like a lot of people are be getting involved with activism and, and really like taking care of themselves and, and, and looking for mutual aid and building community rather than um, relying on like the power structures and voting and stuff. And uh yeah. And, you know, like, I think that was also just like part of the, the, the making of the project itself was like, it really was, um, it ended up being like a DIY sort of like community project by the, by the time the script was. It's, um, it's, you know, there's a meme of Joaquin Phoenix and it says, I'm going to become the Joker. And it seems like in the past few years, like people are leaning into that like becoming that unhinged version of themselves or that like distilled version of themselves yeah no it's uh, it's like it's it was it was always supposed to be i think kind of like leaning into that idea that like that like jokerfication of like reaching a point where it's like everything in your life just feels so fake because like we're just surrounded by like media and social media and like 
you know, I think, I think that year I was kind of realizing like how many of the ideas in my head are my own and how much of them are things that just like other people have put there. Um, I think chaos is really attractive to people right now and in a way that is constructive actually. And it certainly was for me. Right. Um, so, you know, when we, when you and I were younger, we were living in a world where the mainstream Batman adaptations would bounce back and forth between like campy and colorful on one end of the spectrum. And then it would swing over to dark and brooding and serious, serious. Um, yeah. But like, unfortunately in recent years, like the pendulum has stayed over in the dark and brooding side. And there's been a real, I think, lack of the campy and colorful, which I think is really vital part of the equation for Batman. I, I, I think you would probably agree with that. I mean, what do you what do you think about that? Oh, yeah. I mean, for me, it's like. If 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 there isn't some level of camp and fun involved in Batman, I'm really not it's it's not really Batman for me in a lot of ways like i i you know like even the frank miller books are ridiculous you know like they're dark funny. and they're brooding but like yeah. but they're funny like joker you know, yeah they're really funny like joker's like this kind of like gay david bowie vibe like also right. like kind of charles nelson riley in a way too like it, it's it's yeah. uh that's the that's the type of batman that i'm really drawn into and and i wanted to do it uh not only campy and colorful, but also like show, because I think the thing that you you get from camp, and I actually just like talked to one of my favorite filmmakers, Bruce LaBruce about this, because um, I, I was doing this like artist on artist profile with him where I, I, I asked him like, why do you think some people are able to get away with like blending a lot of tones in movies? Like a, a movie like The People's Joker, it, there's ridiculous like crude humor and then in a next scene you'll get this like heartwarming scene with like a mother and her daughter and Bruce's response is to like why like a movie like that was able to get away with it or his work is able to get away with it or is, is just because like camp affords you that sensibility and like it I think it's like what really draws me to just comics in general is like uh, the operatic quality to it that it it should be larger than life because at the end of the day these are these are like really grounded human stories we're seeing most of the time uh, but they're being told with people who like you know like wear rubber suits and stuff <laughs> so. yes yes like I, I think Batman's villains are some of the most psychologically realistic um, and, and intellectual like comic characters but i want to see them reveling in their arch villainy with yeah uh, color coordinated henchmen doing themed crimes that's what i want to see you know and 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 they're they're still like the, that psychological or human truth like you know deep down in it totally totally and like i think that was i think that was also what like early in the process of making the people's joker like i really had this like emotional response to um grant morrison's arkham asylum book just and like i was i'd already been familiar with with it and like i the invisibles is like my favorite graphic novel series of all time so like i i was already pretty obsessed with grant but like coming to that book at that point in my life on the other end of like a lot of a lot of mental illness a lot of periods in my life where like I, you know, like queer people are, are told they're villains every day in society. And like, here's this book where like, it's not only like super psychedelic and like witchy and fun because it's Grant, but like, it, it also like, it's one of the, the few Batman books that I really think like highlights the compassion that Batman himself and that us as viewers and readers can and should have for these, these like, these villains because at the end of the day like I don't know it's easy to go on Twitter and say like 
Batman's like a fascist who beats up mentally ill people or whatever. And like, that's not what I'm saying with this at all. What I'm saying is it's like, there's nuance to it. It's like Two-Face in that book is like making himself miserable. Like he, they literally need to give him a tarot deck because he's stuck in the binary of like a coin. So like, it's like, it really, Um, I just remember like revisiting that book in, in like 2020 and just like crying because it was just like, oh, this is like what, this is like why I care about this so much is like, there's, yeah. there's so much room for like emotional depth within these like kind of silly uh, over the top stories. Well, and um, in, in that book specifically, they were almost going to render Joker in a, in a Madonna cone bra. And I think he even is in the book wearing high heels. Um, yeah. He's, he's, he's uh it's really funny and like that was something that I don't think I really knew until after I was done with the movie like I I mean I was I that's one of my favorite jokers sorry just one sec yeah um that's one of my like favorite jokers of all time I have like four drinks on the ground I'm so right. yeah same here same. uh ADHD <laughs> um same. I uh I I really uh like that is one of the queerest jokers already. Like he's grabbing, he's wearing high heels, as you said, like he's grabbing Batman's butt. Like there's like this acknowledgement that like they're kind of boyfriends. Like they kind mm -hmm. of are in this like codependent relationship. And yeah, it was really fascinating to me that knowing that like Grant had initially pitched that Joker just was gonna be like an overt drag queen. Um, and gosh, like, you know, one of the things that has, I never could have imagined um, happening as a result of making my film, but Grant Morrison has seen the people's Joker and like loves it, which I was really nervous to send them a link just because like the people's Joker probably has one of the worst Batmans of all time in it. Like he's really just like a pathetic, like fascist streaming producer. Uh, yeah. But like, and Grant like just loves Batman, like is in like in this beautiful, like, pure like grant way um mm -hmm. but i think for for them it was there was this like kind of release of seeing somebody just go like all right well warner brothers is never gonna sign off on like like a psychotic drag queen clown um so like this this person clearly just uh put all of her energy into doing that with her friends and i don't know it's it, it felt like a really cool full circle moment just getting to know that Grant not only got to see the movie, but like it, it, it meant something to them because their work has just changed my life. And uh, and it was it was another beautiful moment too of just like I, I when I met them, um, you know, I, I, I articulated that I said like your work just means so much to me. Like I don't know that I would be the kind of writer I am like if if you didn't exist. And they just very simply said like, go pass it on. And it was like. It, it, I felt this like big, uh, I don't know, like I'm getting goosebumps just even thinking about it because like, I think that's what's been so cool about the release of my film is like watching people's reactions to it as as this this like vehicle of like creative inspiration for them. Like the amount of times like people come up to me after screenings and go like, I, I can't believe you can do that. And not just the like parody like aspect of it, but just tell a story that honest because it, it is a story that, um, you know, we don't get to see in genre movies that often. We see them a lot of the times in like, you know, indie movies and like queer cinema, but like very rarely do you get the chance to, to watch uh, what it's like to be a queer and or trans person in, in America. So um, yeah, it's it's cool getting the chance to to pass that on to, to other creators and other queer people and people who just love Batman in general. Um, I, I, um, how, how are you handling that? Like people are seeing it and the things we're <laughs> saying, the things that people are saying about this movie, I, I like they're, they're some of the most like genuine, like, uh, kindest things I've ever seen people say about like a, a piece of art. So, I mean, they're seeing themselves like reflected in it and and having like revelatory experiences watching it. Like it my question is is that what you made is as effective as you intended 
it to be. So as just, I mean, I know what it's like to be an artist and just never be happy with what you made. And there's always, you know, the next thing. So how, how are you handling like it, it, you ate, you know, like how are you handling that? Yeah. Well, honestly, you know, like, I don't even really know what my intention was when I made it. Like, I think it really was just like, I wanted to make something where I, I had, I didn't, I wasn't getting notes. I, at that point, you know, I, I really had gotten burnt out on pitching uh, to, to production companies and like, kind of like trying to get like my story told inside of like a system. So like, really like the through line while I was making it was just like, I'm making this film for me and specifically like 15 year old me. And I'm making it for my friends, you know, cause it really was, as I said earlier, like kind of this, you know, I I had crowdsourced a lot of the um, collaboration that was in the movie. Like I, I put a call out on Twitter after we had started the script and just said like, hey, I'm making this film and uh, it's it's a trans Joker parody movie. And if anybody wants to help me, like, you know, write to me here. And I really was just kind of doing that mostly just originally just to kind of see sort of to gauge interest in like, what kind of people would be drawn to that and like to see if I could get um actors just because like it was a it was a film that had a very large cast like the script was very ambitious and the response was so overwhelming like I got I got hundreds of people that like wanted to do to be involved in the film and it was like you know a lot of visual artists a lot of editors and directors and um a few lawyers and uh you know people who just wanted to not only like work on a movie like that, but like just see a movie like that. So it really felt the entire time. I just had this like beautiful system of support and community around me, like while I was making it. And then in the release of it too, because like, you know, I don't want to talk too much about this, but like when we premiered it initially at, at the Toronto International Film Festival in 2022, like Warner Brothers, sent me like an angry letter basically saying like we did, we don't think this is a parody and we want you to show this letter to any distributor or film festival that wants to play the film which is devastating like i never made the film to get that kind of negative attention like i really didn't it, it was an earnest effort and like i really tried to arm myself with the knowledge of like what goes into a parody film like i was working with lawyers very early in the process to figure that out so that was like a devastating thing that was happening but the community of people that had helped me make it uh, really carried me through that, you know, not just the, the the people that helped me make it, you know, like I was there in Toronto with my co-writer and like, we really like held each other and cried like through it. And uh, Nathan Faustin, who plays the Penguin was also there. And he was like, also one of the people like boots on the ground. And Toronto International Film Festival itself like really went to bat for us and said no we're gonna still screen the movie and we did like they ended up screening the movie so like it's it's always the the sal the salve through it has always been the community and the people that I've been able to sort of lean on and turn to in those times of desperation because um you know it's 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 a movie also where I I made myself very vulnerable. Like it, it is a very personal story. It's very specific. You know, it's been described as like semi-autobiographical and that's just like not true. Like it is just autobiographical. Like the only difference between my life and that and Joker the Harlequin, uh, as we call her in the movie, her life is just like, I, you know, I, I haven't fought Batman, like literally. <laughs> like we just, it's, I'm, sort of just playing with toys and having this conversation these conversations with people that I've actually had and like really personal relationships and stuff so like I think the thing that has been tricky has been um you know not this conversation because this is lovely and, and 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 wonderful but a lot some of the press I've done has been a little weird and, and has made me feel a little naked and vulnerable at times um you know, I dedicated the film to my mom. People will ask me if she's seen it. People will ask me questions like, why did you wait so long to come out of the closet? Which is just an insane question to ask anybody like who's yeah. trans or, or just like, it's so deeply personal. But like, I kind of opened myself up to that in a way. And I think there's something about that that um, like, look, like I, I've 
mental illness is a part of my story and and I could have let all of that really destroy me. And instead I, I really allowed um, the enthusiasm around the project, the good aspects of it, the fact that like I get to watch this movie change people's lives when they see it. Like, you know, I had I had somebody after one of our screenings and, you know, we did a screening, like sold out screening in, in the Music Box Theater in Chicago. And um, this person came up to me afterwards and just said like, hey, like watching your movie just like made me wanna like stay alive. And like, it was like, it I, I don't know, like I, if I speak about it too much, I'll cry. Like, it's really like, it's just the fact that like a piece of art can do that for somebody. And I've had art that I've been able to to witness that, that, uh, that, that has done that for me. Like, you know, um, like it, it means the world and it's, it's, that's the thing that's really kind of carried me through and has made me go like, okay, like there was, there was something good to all this. And, and it's, it's connected me not only to my own humanity, but just everybody else's. Like I, I, I finally kind of feel um, like a person and like I'm not alone. And I think that's that's also just why it's been successful because it's like, it's, it's, a, it's a very personal story. There's a lot of specificity to it. But I think when you tell stories that have that level of specificity, that's the kind of stuff that people identify with. Like, you know, like, there are jokes and things in the movie that I did think were just for me, um, but like people identify with. And I think it's because like when you, when you're telling the truth, like, and you're telling the truth about like kind of the most like deepest, darkest parts of you, like um, not every piece of art does that. So when, when one does it, it really, it really lands for people in this kind of like spiritual sort of esoteric way so um that's just a long-winded way of saying like i think i'm handling it pretty well uh but it's also really uh, forcing me to confront uh the fact that i don't particularly do well with praise um right but i right. think i'm healing my relationship to that good yeah i i mean i can relate to that and i, I never feel want to like feel satisfied by what i've done but like you I mean, I, the the things people are saying about this movie, I can't imagine like what you're feeling, and just like, I I know uh, how you feel about Kevin Smith, and like, <laughs> I, I I you know what you're you're on um so some episodes of a podcast we need to talk about Kevin, um which uh -huh. talks about Kevin Smith, and I uh I really you know uh, connect with with your opinion on it. I feel like we're we're kind of contemporary like came up at the same time um and had the same experience with his films but when i hear people talk about this movie when i see the discourse i, I think about clerks so it's just it's wild for me to, to see uh, knowing what you think about kevin smith and i feel like his um the biggest impact he had wasn't just a specific film but it's inspiring people to just get out do your fucking idea man just get it out there max out your credit cards and <laughs> you know call in favors and you know whatever you got to do and like you're on the other side of it and uh, like you did it and and i know there's just so many people um they have you know artistic aspirations and and they they're waiting maybe for permission to do their their thing um like, like yeah. what would you say to and, a and person it'll never come yeah it'll, what would you that, say to that person that, it just like, I, I think like, I mean, look, like some people are very fortunate. Um, you know, I have a lot of friends who were able to sort of like come up as directors inside of like the industry and like sort of graduate, so to speak. But like for most people, that's not the case. Like it's a very competitive, any, any art field, if you're trying to make money doing it and like actually support yourself, like it's always going to be competitive. That gets, um, more and more true every day uh and i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing uh because on some level it it's what creates movies like like mine or 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 clerks you know like i think like and gosh you know like i <laughs> i don't regret anything that i've said about kevin smith publicly <laughs> but um but i one thing i 
because I do think like especially like some of the critiques of chasing Amy specifically is one where like when I watch it I'm like did this keep me in the closet like I I wonder how much of it uh like how destructive this might have been for some queer people but at the same time it's like I remember seeing that movie and it was like probably the first time I ever even heard the word lesbian you know like sure uh and since you know releasing my film I've I actually you know I haven't gotten the chance to talk to Kevin directly yet I hope I get to someday uh but I sent him a message after my movie came out and was just like, hey, like, I want you to know, because I know he's seen some of the stuff I've said about him. He's 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 retweeted some of my negative uh, commentary from time to time. Uh, and I know how much he takes uh, criticism to heart. And and I, I sent him this message that was just like, when I'm doing that, that's not me attacking you. And I was like, I, I I think on some level, it's me kind of maybe like kind of harming my inner child in a way. Like when I really think about how important those movies were to me at like 15, sure. like, right. And how yeah. embarrassed I am about, you know, just what it was like being 15 and stuff uh, for anybody, especially like a closeted trans woman. But like, um, you know, I told him like, think about like how you've talked about George Lucas sometimes, <laughs> you know, like, sure. And I and I made a point of telling him too, like I I probably would have never I would have never gotten here if it wasn't for clerks and things like clerks. Um, and I think you know, thank you for saying saying that and comparing it to because like I think that was um, it's interesting that that was the journey that I took to make that film. Like it never I never had a moment in my life where I was like, oh okay, like I'm gonna make a movie that is like kind of like a memoir or something in that same way that like clerks was for him at that point in his life but like you know it's people like him that gave me the courage and um and link letter uh and i think you know like a lot of the bruce the bruce um john waters like the, the kind of people who like make stuff that uh only they can make i think like that type of artist is essential just to the ecosystem of like cinema or like any artistic field. Um, and it's how uh, these things kind of get pushed forward. So like, I'm so thankful for for Kevin Smith and Kevin, if you if you see this or at, at any point, like, please give me a call. I, I'd love to, I'd love to, I know you don't smoke weed anymore. Uh, let's, let's get some some tea or something yeah when he when he gives a shit he can still like he still has the juice i think red state i think he was cooking with red yeah. state honestly and i wish he would he would give a shit a little bit more i'm excited to see his next movie because it, it kind of seems like a little bit of a return i know it's like kind of about you know his, his love of movies like when he was a mm. kid he's strongest when he's making something that is entertaining to him and like has some, means something to him and that he's not thinking about his fans or like the kind of like uh right ecosystem of like fans and comic culture that he's in like i think those are the the times where like it, his work really doesn't work for me that much but even in the stuff that like he's done that doesn't really work for me that much like like jane silent bob reboot like a real slog to get through but like getting to watch jason muse be like a really no. grounded like it's so, it's so beautiful and like um yeah i don't know on some level like that kind of those kind of movies are like a lot more interesting and fun for me to watch than like something that's like perfect or sleek or polished um but yeah i'd love to see him return to like really personal stuff but having said that like uh my partner and i just rewatched mall rats and and it was like Oh, this might be my favorite Kevin Smith yes, movie now. Like it is it's so good. Amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, so so speaking of like polish and stuff, um you like comparing your film to traditional superhero movies, you made this for far less uh money, far fewer resources. Oh yeah. But your film is honestly it's more visually inventive or visually memorable than like many superhero movies that have hundreds of millions of dollars behind them. so i i'm curious like and oh, you're an editor you. 
and when you're creating these like expressionistic visuals, like when your character uses Smilex, like what what are you drawing from? What do you what inspires you? Where 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 and how do you kind of keep um, the narrative within, you know, the the hallucinatory, crazy shit? Yeah, I mean, like I think I think a little bit of it is just that camp influence that I was talking about, where it's like that that really affords you it creates a layer of separation. Uh, you know, like I think about like the early John Waters movies too, like something like Desperate Living, where like the sets literally look like they're made of fucking cardboard, and like he built like a whole city, and like a whole like I fucking love Desperate Living. Like it's so uh, it's it's of all of his movies, it feels like a fairy tale to me, and was like a huge influence on the People's Joker in 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 that way. Um, I think like when you lean into your limitations, you can kind of get away with having those limitations. And, and, you know, there was, when Brie and I were writing the script, we would come up with ideas and then we would like, usually like hit a point like during every session where we were working together or, or even on our own where we're like, wait, how are we going to do this? Like we just wrote like a Batmobile chase scene that is, has two characters breaking up and then the car crashes like what are we gonna do and like we kind of just stayed like in the moment and we we're like well let's not really worry about it like let's just figure that out when the time comes and I think like being able to have like a team of people and like all these sort of disparate aesthetics um was helpful too and like kind of took the pressure off like you know like knowing that the movie was never gonna look perfect that like the green screen, every single shot in it is is on green screen. Um, and that is because we're telling a story that like is a huge story. Like there's so many locations and, you know, so there's like 1600 or, or 16,000 VFX shots in the movie or something. And like, that is a huge number for any film, especially one, even ones with budgets. Like there are Marvel movies that don't have that number of VFX shots. And like, I think like sort of creating this like high bar of like ambition for us and knowing that like necessity was gonna have to be the mother of invention, like was really kind of the guiding light. And I think like some of my influence from that was really coming from like working on Adult Swim stuff and, and working with Tim and Eric, um, you know, that's a very lo-fi aesthetic that that they're operating in. Um, and like, at the same time, like it works. Like you're not sitting there and going like, oh, this looks like shit and it's not funny because of it. So like, that was something that gave me some bravery. And I think it was also um, Natural Born Killers. Uh, specifically the sort of psychedelic hallucinatory aspects of the film like natural born killers is a movie when it starts it doesn't stop it never gives you a, a second to breathe and and when it does it, it it's like it's like a a trick they're playing on you and then they rip the rug out from under you and then throw you back into this like chaotic insanity of like you know almost like you're flipping through channels or something while having like a really powerful uh, psychedelic experience. And like, I think watching that and revisiting that uh, while I was making Joker, the people's Joker, it was like, oh, like you can do this. Like you can make something that moves at this like breakneck speed and like has um, a lot of different aesthetics and, and, and lore in it. And, uh, and, you know, on some level too, like, and that's, I think the part of this that has, been both very freeing and very scary at times is like I was very consciously trying to break the rules that I was taught uh as an editor and as a VFX artist like specifically like a note I used to get all the time was like I don't know what the scene is like anymore like is it supposed to make me laugh or cry or whatever and I and my response would always be like yes yeah like does it right. have like you know, like, especially like in an adult swim space where it's kind of like experimental, like I think, you know, and I think like comedians and especially comedians, but just creators in general sometimes create too many rules for themselves. Like I, I worked with Sasha Baron Cohen for a very long time, like on, on, on a show called Blues America. And he's somebody who has like a very regimented system to like how he constructs jokes. And 
has a lot of rules. Like one of them being like, you can't do too many jokes at once. Otherwise people will miss the jokes, which was such a maddening rule to me because I was like, well, then they can watch it again. Like, don't you want them to watch it again? Like think about the best scenes in Borat too, where it's like, you know, like. Right, right. A lot of different things are happening at once. Yeah, layers. And, um, so yeah, yeah. And, and in the people's joker, I wanted to do that to like an obsessive degree where it's just like, you'll be able to take it in. You'll be able to get the basic story but there will be so much jokes and lore and and detail that if you really want to see it all, you're going to have to watch it at least one more time. Probably yeah. like over multiple, multiple viewings over the course of a lifetime, because those are like yeah. my favorite types of films. It's very dense. And, and speaking of the your use of like animation, the film switches mediums just, you know, from moment to moment. And... Um, it makes sense, you know, oh yeah, okay, so they, you know, she had a scene with like six characters in costume battling Batman, they did that animated, but you also use it in like intimate moments too, maybe, actually maybe one of the more, most intimate uh, scenes in the movie with you and Mr. J, which I thought was really interesting, it never feels like I'm watching a different movie when it switches oh. mediums, um, but I, I can I can picture your decision making process of like okay, um, practically I can't get all these characters and all these costumes battling Batman with the Batmobile etc. I'll do it animation and that'll be easier. And then you get into it and you're like, oh, I have to create all these assets uh, bespoke, you know, <laughs> for, to fit this other universe in a different medium. And it's actually so like, how do you handle like the scope creep and 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 how do you kind of have the um, the discipline to to finish the damn thing? Like, because because oh, as God. you get closer to being done, it's like more things come up that need to be buttoned up, and it's like how it's like how it's like the finish line stretches farther and farther away. Like, well, you, and that and that discipline? finish that finish line kept moving too as as the project. Like long after I thought it was going to ever go. Like, because the, the cut we screened in, at the Toronto International Film Festival was a very early cut. It was very much a fresh paint job. And then we did, you know, other film festivals afterwards. And like while I was screening at, at those festivals and, you know, we, we, we did like a little secret screening tour in Australia and, and in some parts of the U.S. and like, I was still working on the movie and like polishing and tightening even right down to like when I got a distribution partner for our like theatrical release, like, you know, he gave me finishing funds because not only did I need to license, I needed to license some of the music and like get the score down. But like, it was like, really like there was just still like time and energy that sort of needed to go into that. And like, I think that was that sort of discipline that you're describing um, is something that I did not have at the start of, of, of making the film. Uh, I had no idea how long the film would take me to make, even though I knew it was ambitious, even though I knew there were all these aspects of it, like I had no idea of, I, I thought it was gonna take me six months maybe to finish the movie. <laughs> took me like three years, technically like four. And like, I think like, while I was in it, there was a certain point where it was just, I had to realize like, okay, like you gotta just prioritize some shots. Like, you know, there's some things where it's like, okay, we're gonna be hanging out in this like scene where two people are just sitting and talking um, for an extended period of time. That's probably a sequence where we're really gonna wanna like, really focus on green screen removal so it doesn't take you out of the 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 sure. feeling of, of of the film right and like then there's other ones where it's like if you pause at certain parts you'll just see like half of my head missing and like there's uh you know a, a, another perfect example like the film ends with this like musical number and like during my big kind of closing number uh like while i'm singing through the bridge uh parts of my face, like the green screen, the blue screen we use, like it's shining through. So you're seeing the background, like kind of coming in through my right. eyes. And like, 
I remember very specifically working on that sequence like two weeks before um before we were supposed to premiere it in Toronto and like kind of just that was a moment one of the many moments where I realized like oh I could work on this forever yeah and this is like a shot I care about this is a moment I care about because like I'm singing it's this moment like I uh, and I'm singing beautifully <laughs> and I want like people to like take it seriously and stuff but like there was this beautiful kind of like poetry to having that shot not be perfect um because the movie isn't perfect it's supposed to be rough around the edges it's supposed to be punk and kind of held together by tape so I think like there's no simple answer like I think it was kind of like the alchemy of whatever scenes the scenes called for the, the sequence you mentioned the two sequences you mentioned specifically the the big fight scene at the end um which we do in the whole Bruce Tim uh Batman the animated series style like that was a sequence that we worked on for like three years. Like I started, we started, I built the animatic for that sequence before we even had the script finished. So like, I, cause I knew that was going to be one that like, it needed to look like Batman, the animated series, which is just one of the most beautifully animated shows of all time. And like, it was going to take a team and a lot of time to put it together. So you know, we prioritize that. And then the other, the the other one you mentioned, the, the the sort of love scene that comes in the middle of the film. Um, I always knew that that was going to be animated the second the um the uh we were writing the script and, and got to that scene. I was like, I really want this one to be animated because it's kind of this bridge. Like that point in the movie is this sort of bridge from like innocence into you know, kind of being like a grown up person and like I really wanted it to start as this kind of like beautiful almost like Steven Universe kind of uh like cute queer like oh it's so pretty and then by the end of it it's like it's kind of sexy and like sad and like has all this like nuance to it and like to me it's like there was something about doing that animated that not only felt safer to me just because it, it was a it's a scene that I'm it's a one of the most personal scenes in the movie, like everything that happens in that sequence is just my life and, and taken from my uh, early queer experiences that I have with my, one of my exes. And like, um, so it was like emotionally safer for me to kind of do it in this like animated way, but just aesthetically and like story momentum wise, um, it made sense. So uh, thanks for letting me talk about that aspect of it. And just even for asking because I think a lot of people sometimes watch the movie and go like oh like it's just like whatever works and it's like it really is it like there was a lot of intention into um why we did certain styles at certain points and, and sometimes it was pragmatic and sometimes it was just like hey this feels better and mm -hmm. uh I think that's just kind of the name of the game when you're making something low budget too um so you, you've got a home video release coming up. I'm really excited for that because I think it's going to be just more accessible to people. Um, and I, I think there's there's definitely jokes and there's moments in the movie that are going to become memes, honestly. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> I'm not going to spoil it, but you use the character Alexander Knox, um, who <laughs> many people would remember as like the journalist who follows Kim Basinger around in Batman 89. Um, you use this character in the most unexpected way. It's so goddamn funny. Um, oh, I, I wonder, it makes me wonder what Cassavetes would say about uh, Robert Wurr's performance. <laughs> um, but if, <laughs> if, if you could uh, pick anything like from the movie to become part of the popular consciousness, like what would it be? What would, it, what would be your... Oh, Wow. Nobody's ever asked me this question before. Um, I'll, I mean, I'll tell you, there, in theater, Suicide Cop just killed, killed, killed. Yeah, no, that was what I was going to say is I think I think there's a character in the movie that's called Suicide Cop that we, I guess, is is our James Gordon. Like, I never really like oh, okay. say specifically who he is, but okay. like he's kind of. I think like James Gordon in our Batman universe is kind of like closer to like Dick Wolf or something. Cause like all okay. the like cops and like politicians in the movie are kind of like 
closer to like, you know, media figures. Um, that is a character that I would love to, to, to just see fully embraced, which is so funny because it's like, that the only reason that character is in the movie is because, you know, and, and the idea, if you haven't seen the movie, Suicide Cop is exactly what it sounds like. He's a character who is a police officer that uh, kills himself at the first sign of danger. Yeah. Uh, and then, cut, you know, somehow survives it. Like, it's kind of got like a Bugs Bunny Looney Tunes logic to it. Um, and like, I had shot an entire pilot <laughs> Of, of Suicide Cop, like about 10 years ago uh, with Nate Faustin, who plays Penguin in the movie, and uh, our, our friends David Allen and, and Jeremy Franchi, who, play, who plays Suicide Cop. And um, we we made this pilot. We all spent so much time and energy making it, and we only screened it once because, like, it was so dark. <laughs> it was just like, I mean, like, I don't know, like, it's fun to watch a police officer kill themselves because, like, fuck the police. But, like, you don't really, you underestimate just how kind of intense it is just to watch multiple suicides happen back to back. Like, in the title sequence oh, alone sure. for a suicide cop, he, <laughs> sure. he fucking poisons himself. Like, it's, so, um, this is, like, a, a real redemption arc for him in this way that I'm like, oh, I'm so glad people are embracing him. And, uh... The Suicide Cop pilot is going to actually be on uh, the DVD special features, oh, that's so great. Uh, people will finally get to watch it. Your your character in the movie is like a struggling comedian, and and they're like they're a mean comedian. They're you know like yes. laughing at um, other people's kind of tragedies, and I I thought it was kind of an interesting reflection of like edge lord comedians, but then also kind of edge lord like Snyder Bros and stuff. Was that by design or is that kind of just incidental you know i i don't know about the snyder aspect of it like it's it's funny because like i love Zack snyder movies because like they're so uh in tone complimentary uh they feel very gay to me <laughs> they're very like focused on like bodies and gender right. in this way that is very almost like People describe it as like toxic sometimes, but I really just think it's like sections of the fandom, which like sections of any like superhero or sci-fi fandom is always going to be toxic. It's like so funny when I see people act like, especially like something like Star Wars. It's like, why are people being so toxic about Star Wars? I'm like, Star Wars has been toxic since it came out. <laughs> like right. it just always yeah. is. But like, and with Snyder, it's like, I, I'm really drawn to it. I think in that like sort of operatic way, I think I think this sort of like mean comedian thing was somewhat me processing um, the feelings of being exploited as as a as a as a filmmaker and as a as an artist in, in television. Um, you know, also like David Liebehart is 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 in the film. Uh, and he plays Ray Shaw Ghoul. Um, I'm very proud that, you know, we are one of the few Batman uh, related things to have a person of color as Ray Shah Ghoul because like, it just is so weird to me that they're usually just like a British guy. Um, but David Liebehart is uh, an actor. Uh, he's, he's a multi-hyphenate. Like he's an actor, he's a musician, he's a puppeteer. And I've seen, you know, and, and he comes from that Tim and Eric world. Um, I've seen people talk about you know, the stuff that he appears in sometimes is being exploitive. And to me, uh, you know, especially in, in the the stuff that he did with Tim and Eric, like I, I, I'm really like, one of my like life missions is just to set the record straight that like, there's no bigger Tim and Eric fan than David Liebehart. Like he loves yeah. working with those guys and um, like quotes every sketch he's ever been in, quotes sketches that he wasn't in. Like he's, 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 uh, but when people talk about me or they talk about like other like marginalized creators in this way of like being exploited or like, are they fully aware? Are they in on the joke? Um, it's removing agency from the artist that's involved in the project. And I I kind of am a firm believer that if you have a headshot and uh, you know, you, you, you aren't really, you're, you're, you're exploiting yourself at the end of the day. Um, sure. But like, I think too that like uh, speaking of the sort of like edgelord humor thing, like I I am a recovering edgelord. Like I grew up like I was a 
creature of the internet. Like I was on the IMDb forums, the fucking something awful. Right. Um, you know, and I think there's a lot of, I think a lot of trans people, a lot of queer people have that arc of like mm-hmm. kind of coming from this like sort of like space of like, uh, you know, edgelord comedy and root comedy. And like, I kind of wanted to like pick that apart for myself. And I think there's an aspect of like Joker the Harlequin's arc in the film that like, it's kind of her learning that like, okay, like I shouldn't be exploiting my friends when I'm making art. And I also shouldn't be exploiting myself. Like I should be giving myself agency and in standing proud of like the thing I'm making. And uh, I don't know, it's, 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 it's tricky to kind of talk about because it's like one of the things I think about the film itself that is kind of very meta Cause it's like the, it's one of the rudest movies ever made in my opinion. Like it, it really, it's, it's, there's jokes in it that I think do offend people. Um, and I, you know, part of that was reclaiming that kind of comedy. Uh, Cause I think, you know, queer people invented that kind of comedy. And unfortunately, like now, whenever people talk about it, talk about us, sometimes it's coming from like those Snyder bros. They're, they're acting like we all are like woke scolds and like are too hypersensitive and, Right. On some level, I get that conversation because, like, we do live in um, in reactionary times. Uh, but generally speaking, like, my queer friends and I, we talk like that. And, and we've had to sort of find our own, like, moral compass in, like, what is, when is a joke going too far? And I wanted the film itself to be just sort of a, de- uh, like, a, a meta demonstration of that that you get to watch over the course of, like, 90 minutes. Thanks for you. Really did ask come up with questions here that nobody's asked me before. Oh, so good. I'm you. glad. I will, and I, you know what? I was gonna ask. I'm glad you brought up David Liebhart because I was gonna bring him up. You like because you got this like very soulful, like touching performance out of him, and I just can't imagine him being like a performer that you get precise results from. So like I, I don't know how you were able to make a space for that, um, but you did. Well, and he's he tremendous. I worked with him for, thank you so much. Like I'm so proud of, of the performance that David and I found together. Um, a lot of that just came from the fact that I've known David for like, God, as long as I've been in LA, like, like, I guess like almost 13 years. And, uh, we made a, we made a show together called I love David. That was, um, uh, a docu-series sort of just about his life. Cause he has a fascinating life. It's like he's, a UFO experiencer. He um, is a Christian scientist. Like he, he was roommates with Robin Williams. He's like full right. of crazy Hollywood stories. And like, right. um, so we had, we had worked together on, on that show. And, and so I kind of knew what I was getting into casting him. Like he's, he's, he's the most punk person I know. Like just, just the guy hasn't had a real job. And I, I think, like 60 years like he really makes his living as an artist in a way that's like aspirational for me and um I wanted to give him the chance to like have a role that he wouldn't have have you know nobody is like calling up David Liebehart to give them the like Obi-Wan Kenobi part in like a sci-fi in like a fantasy movie right um and also like you know Ray Shagul and Joker the Harlequin's dynamic in 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 that film is very much like close to David's in my relationship. Like uh, David is somebody that you know when we when we hang out, we mostly talk about spirituality. We talk about art and creation. Um, when I was making I Love David with him, I had just started transitioning, and and he was honestly like this maybe the first or second person that I came out to as trans, and when I did. God, it was like the best coming out because like he just his response was just like, oh, OK, well, I I knew a lot of transsexuals in the 70s because I used to I used to paint murals at sex clubs and I, I'd see them all the time. They're lovely people. And it was like, God, like this man is like this guy literally grew up when segregation was still happening. <laughs> He's like old as dirt and like nice. he just lovingly embraced me uh during a time where I really needed it and like um you know he's been somebody that has always been just this beacon of uh 
hope and encouragement and spirituality to me. And I really wanted to like immortalize that in a, in a way in, in that part. Um, and it's, I, his and my scenes together, I think are like my favorite in the film. Um, and, and, I, I I just love David Liebhart so much. I, I hope I get to work with him uh, again at some point soon. Uh, yeah, he's great. Did you ever know Richard Dunn in person? I didn't. Richard yeah. Richard died right before I became an intern at yeah. Tim and Eric. And uh, it was so sad because like, and it was, you know, it was sad, but it was also this beautiful experience of like coming into that company as a fan Mm. And I guess kind of having that thing of like, oh, do these, do these like, you know, like bizarre people that they put on camera, like, are they right. treated well? Is it like, right. like Howard Stern? And like, it was the first introduction to like, oh no, this is like a family. Like his, his passing was really, um, I think kind of really like affected everybody uh, a lot. I have met James Qual. I've gotten him, I've gotten to work with James a couple times. So it's just like honestly, James is like one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. Like in his his uh just a joke machine. Uh it's like hard to have a conversation with him because he just kind of like is constantly joking. Um I, I believe and, that. uh yeah. It's it's cool. Like all of those guys, like Ron Oster, uh Tennessee Winston Luke, uh, mm. Ben Hur. I got to work with those three on a show called Beef House, uh, which I wrote and directed with Tim and Eric. Um, and like, they're all such beautiful, unique human beings that have, knowing them has like, I don't know, it's been like food for my soul in this way. And like, especially like David, like, David and I, like a year into our friendship, realized that we literally grew up like right down the street from each other. Like obviously like decades apart. Sure. Um, but there's just something, I don't know. I I, I talked about it recently with um, a friend how like, I think like art and creation really has this potential to be a connection to source and, and spirit. I'm very new agey. So I apologize to everybody um, who's still watching. But I, 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 I really, it's a very spiritual thing for me. And like that collection of people um, in, in high and Tim Heidecker as well, like they, they, they feel like they're a part of my like soul family or something. Cause whenever we like work together or even just get lunch together, it's like, I feel that, that connection to this like pure me. And I think they all feel it too. Like, I don't know. I'm really hoping I, I get to, I run in cause Ron Oster, um, goes to comic-con every year and I'm, I'm gonna be there uh this year for a panel and I'm, I'm really hoping that i get to run into him again because whenever i see him it's just like it's just a joy it's just a pure beautiful joy the last tim and eric live tour they did i think it was right before the pandemic um they ended that show with an episode of beef house which hadn't come out yet and you know at the time sitting there i'm like oh well i wish I, they were gonna do more stuff on stage instead of watching this show but the show played it was the hot tub episode it killed it annihilated <laughs> um and i yeah. think i think actually that might have been the first time i like saw your name and thought like I, i've seen that name before she's been around um oh. I, I could talk to you all day about like your comedy stuff i'm just gonna stick to one question um you, you've worked with a ton of incredible comedians of course tim and eric sasha baron cohen um, Tim Robinson, Eric Andre, Nathan Fielder, like we could keep going down the line, but I think the most underappreciated of, of your, um, CV is the birthday boys. And I'm just curious if you have oh, a birthday yes. boys sketch. I love the birthday. Oh boys. my God. I fucking thank you for bringing them up because I forget to bring them up sometimes. Like I, I, that show God, yeah, that was like one of those experiences that I was just describing where it was just like, I was in the right place at the right time. Like that show was really the bridge to me becoming, going from an assistant editor, which generally speaking, assistant editors don't really get to edit. They're mostly just syncing and, and logging footage and stuff. But um, they were the first guys that really gave me a chance to uh, prove myself as an editor um, on season one of that show. And uh it was, I, so I think my favorite sketch has to be, um, 
one of the first things I ever edited for them, which was the uh, uh, Glanner Brugner, uh, who's like their version of of, of Walt Disney. Yeah. Uh, and he has a he has this instead of Mickey Mouse, he has like a a dead mole named uh, Fucky. Right. <laughs> like right. I actually have a Fucky tattoo. Yes. Um, which other people have gotten now. I, I encourage everybody to get a Fucky tattoo um, so that I'm not the only one. Um, but that was one that was a lot of fun. I think because of all the world building that went into it, you know, it really was like, I got to make like a parody of Steamboat Willie for it that I animated by hand. Oh, awesome. I I got I got to do like a, uh, the, the theme park, the Glanner Frogner theme park that was mostly made just like with stock footage and stuff. And like, it was just such a beautiful, expansive um, thing working with those guys. They're they're so they're so funny and they're just like so sweet. Uh, and they're everybody so should check fun. out Birthday Boys. They're yeah. so funny. I think Tim Calpacus might be one of the funniest human beings to exist. Oh, um, exactly. Like definitely, uh, definitely one of the funniest living comedians. Well, so I mean, like as an editor, I you know I didn't know if you know the sound of sproing was something that you had your hands on just because it's about I can't editing remember that was you know it i think that was like i definitely did a lot of sound design for that because there was so the thing that was so crazy about that show specifically and more so i think than any show i've ever worked on uh as an editor or otherwise there was a real auteur focus to it they were so hands-on like the the reason i think those sketches are so good is because they really leaned into like the genres and the like things they were they were parodying. So like, yeah, that yeah. whole like flying the flying uh, the history of aviation thing. Like I remember us like working on that so much. Like I definitely did some of the sound design on that. Um, and oh, I gotta like shout out Odenkirk. Like that mm, was yeah. that was my first experience ever working with him and getting to meet him. And it was just like, I don't know, like one of one of the first famous people I think I ever met and got to work with that just felt like a dude you know like he right. just was like oh this is just like a Chicago guy and like he just like is like so humble in this way that it's like it was almost as if like especially at that point in his career I don't think he understood how important Mr. Show was to a lot of us and how yeah. like it was the only like sketch comedy show that you know i guess next to like kids in the hall um that i was ever really interested in as a kid i mean like i liked snl i wanted to be on snl as a kid but like kids in the hall and mr show were like it was like actual art and i think that's like yeah. what birthday boys was to me too it was like i wish they could have done more seasons like i think it really was this like thing uh mm -hmm. where like they were like the last show to exist that was just like seven white guys you know yeah <laughs> right right it's no true. diversity yeah. really yeah ten dads um <laughs> yeah. well and it's just not it's not fair and not to not that i'm dissing these other shows but it's just not fair that like portlandia and like documentary now get a thousand seasons and birthday boys got two it's not right um it's really not it's it I, all I, I feel totally Oh, I, I was just going to say, I feel totally comfortable throwing uh, IFC under the bus because yes. I think that is a, uh, because I also, I was an editor on Comedy Bang Bang and that was a show that I was oh, always right. shocked that we lasted as long as we did. Like, because like, God, I mean, I won't say like Scott Ackerman, um, maybe the best boss I've ever had. Just one of the most talented comedy writers who's ever lived. And uh, nobody watched that show while it was airing. Right. Uh, but I'd say like that and Birthday Boys and Beef House are the things that people usually bring up to me, which is so funny because they they still feel like the most obscure things that I've worked on, especially Beef House, which is like kind of lost media at this point. Like it's oh, easier sure, to yeah. watch the People's Joker, which is kind of a tragedy in my opinion. Um, I, I wake up, I'm not even making this up. I wake up like once a month and I have the Wacky Mitch dude minute one song in my head yes, yes, yeah. yes. years oh, later God. i'm not kidding that song just still it follows me around minute one um <laughs> very true you've been very generous with your time i think we should wrap oh, it up you. um your movie's coming out on home video is it's up for pre-order right now right yeah it's up for pre-order um i think 
I don't know when the DVDs come out, but if you go to thepeoplesjoker.com or alteredinnocence.com, you can find a link uh, to those. We're also, you know, I really think, uh, I'm so glad it's coming out on video, if only so people on Twitter stop yelling at me. Uh, but like, uh, so more people will get to watch it, but it is a, it's a theatrical experience. And I, I don't think our theatrical run is really going to ever end. We're, we're doing um, some screenings this month in July and, and uh, I can't really say when uh, or, or, or what yet, just because it hasn't been announced, but, but there will be an international tour probably this year where we'll be screening it in theaters. Like I, I really want it to never leave theaters. Um, just because uh, you can't beat that that communal experience watching a movie like this. But uh, yeah, peoplesjoker.com if, if you want to find out where our screenings are or, or uh, how to get a copy of it. And it'll be on VOD uh, very soon as well. Um, so yeah, keep a lookout. Right. Um, yeah, well, I'm. people are going to be watching this movie in 20 years. It's and and when you at home when you get a chance to watch it you'll understand why. Thank you very much, Vera Drew. Thank you so much, Josh. This was a blast. Great.